Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. This is Daryl. How you guys are doing? Hope you guys hey, had a, a, a happy holiday. Got some time off. Um, before I jump into this week's stuff, uh, slightly unusually, everything that was due normally yesterday is due today. So I have a feeling some of you might still be working on the, uh, the main assignment. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If I uh, can, we can we can talk about that right now. If it's anybody has any, any uh, need for or has on their mind or anything like that, uh, those of you that did uh, turn in your your uh, 1.4s early, I was able to get those graded today. They looked good. So, uh, uh, does anybody have any questions about uh, what's due tonight? Okay, well, then we'll just move on. Uh, no problem. So this is week two, we're moving on. We've seen some, some really interesting presentations and now we're gonna to start to create our own. And uh, uh, among the assignments we have, we're now introducing several readings from the other book, Slideology. We have a chapter of uh, Resonate that we also want you to read, but we have uh, several chapters of the first book that we want you to look at. One is called The Five Theses of the Power of the Presentation. And as this was Nancy's first book, it was her first attempt to tell us why she thought presentations were important. And here we get a number of truisms that we can carry with us, uh, you know, that, that Nancy is always trying to sort of uh, uh, imprint on our brain. First one you heard last week, the audience is the hero, the audience is the king, that we want to focus in on knowing who that audience is, knowing what they're looking for, what they're expecting, what they relate to, who they are demographically, so that we, we know as much about them as we can, because as the presenter, it's our job to appeal to them. It's our job to persuade them. And if we don't know them, then our arguments are, you know, just uh, going into the air. But to the extent that we can be strategic about our arguments, we have to know who the audience is. And so that's the number one task at hand before you start your presentation, is figuring out who you're wanting to talk to, what their needs are, what they want to hear, what will appeal to them, and so forth. The audience is the hero. Uh, next, presentations should move quickly. They're very viral. They, they move people, they spread ideas, presentations are really terrific for laying down a notion and then letting it go from there. You're not completing an argument, you're starting, you're laying a notion in someone's head. Um, I don't know, there was a, a Christopher Nolan movie called Inception, in which uh, he had fancy technology where he could make people fall asleep and he'd get inside their heads and he would plant a notion there and that notion would would, would stir and, and activate people to do what he wished. And that's what we're talking about here. We're using our words, we're using ideas to inveigle ourselves into other people's minds and create viral messages. They move very fast because once people have that thread, they spread it around. We're using visuals to help people understand what we wanna say. We wanna help them see what we're saying. Uh, our words are important. What we say is important, crafting the script, using your voice is incredibly important. But in addition, in order to get the audience to sort of see that movie in the back of their mind, your slides are also incredibly important. The visuals that you choose to accompany your words help people to understand and, and move through your narrative. And uh, to that extent, the visuals are communication. They're not just pretty pictures. We're not practicing decoration, but we are designing intent. So your images matter. What you put on a slide matters. The combination of text and image matters. And all of these things have to be thought of and planned ahead of time. And finally, within a presentation, there are a number of dynamics that are going on. If you have a live presentation and you are standing in the same room as your audience, then there is the dynamic between the speaker and the audience. You actually can read the room. So if you find that 
people are, are getting listless, you can pump more energy into it. If you find that people are, are drifting or not understanding, you can try to be a little more clarifying in your words. Uh, you can adjust live in a live presentation because you have that feedback relationship. Now we're creating offline presentations, so we don't have that option. We have to make our voiceover the best that we can make it. And we have to think about all the issues and, and parameters ahead of time. And that's where planning becomes much more important. But even in an offline presentation, there is a relationship that goes on between the voiceover track, which is probably you just talking, and the slides, the images. And as the audience is listening to your voice and watching the slides, there's a dynamic going on there. And that's the dynamic that you create. So to the extent that your slides are synchronous with your words, that they are helping to explain what you have to say, that they move the audience, they're an integral part of the presentation that you're creating. So these are all some of the ideas that Nancy Duarte put forth. Uh, another interesting thing that you're going to read this week, and again, um, note that on the 2.2 uh, the, the page where you can link to the O'Reilly books, if you're having trouble getting to O'Reilly books, down at the bottom in the downloads, we've given you links to both Resonate and Slideology. So um, we didn't have Slideology there last week because you didn't need it. But if you need Slideology, there's a PDF of that file. So you can download it and read it offline if you like. But uh, another one of the uh, parts of the reading that's really important is she describes what she calls the presentation ecosystem. The processes that you go through to create a presentation. And this is incredibly important. I remember last week I said that the big mistake that practically everybody makes is they open up PowerPoint too soon. They just start making slides without having figured everything else out. Well, what is everything else? What is the process that you need to go through so that you're not doing the slides ahead of time or out of context or incorrectly? Well, the presentation ecosystem is Nancy Duarte's uh, attempt to say, these are the processes you need to go through to have a really good, complete, considered presentation. And um, an ecosystem is um, the environment you create in. You know, we're very familiar with uh, the filmmaking process, even though none of us, maybe not all of us are filmmakers, the Hollywood movie process is something that's kind of promoted itself. And we understand that there is a three phases of movie making. There's pre-production, production, and post-production. And in pre-production, you do things like write the script and hire the actors and build the sets and uh, collect the budget. And, and, and you do all of the planning things that you can do because production is very, very expensive. Now this is uh, this isn't necessarily related to the way we make presentations, but this is the process that we all kind of understand the creative act to go through. And in the Hollywood days, it was very very expensive to go on the set and uh, and be filming. So you wanted to be as efficient as possible. So you spent as much time as you needed to in pre-production to plan it all out and to schedule it, so that uh, you had as few days as possible in production where you were shooting the camera and you had all the actors on, who were on call and getting paid and you had all the staff people who were there getting paid, et cetera. And if anything went wrong, it would knock out the schedule. And uh, in the old days, it was even more intense because film was a chemical process. So you shot the film one day and you didn't even know if you actually had the shots until the next day when they, they uh, developed it all and you watched what they called dailies. And, uh, uh, a regular part of the process was just the day after you shot everything, looking to make sure that it all was there so you didn't have to shoot it over again. Nowadays, we work digitally, everything is instantaneous. If you get something wrong, you can make it, uh, you can uh, remake it immediately. So uh, the digital process makes us much more efficient, makes us much faster, but it's still worthwhile thinking about what are these processes because they're kind of like a flight check order, you know, um, the way pilots have to fly a plane. Uh, the more complicated a plane is, 
the longer the flight checklist is. But you have to go through every, every point on that flight checklist or else you may have missed something crucial. And in the presentation ecosystem, you wanna make sure that you've addressed all the issues so that after the fact, you don't find yourself uh, you know, saying, oh darn, I should have done X, Y, and Z. And so uh, with a movie process system, production is all in one tight phase in the middle. You shoot all the film, then it's all done and processed. And post-production is simply an assembly process in which you're editing the film together, you're putting the soundtrack together, you're doing the promotionals and you're assembling the piece together. Well, with presentations, uh, it works a little bit differently. And in the modern day, it all works differently, even in the filmmaking process, because uh, in the Hollywood filmmaking process, it was big, heavy equipment and hundreds of thousands of people. And nowadays it's one person with a single laptop and that laptop is the place where pre-production, production and post-production all takes place simultaneously. So you can be writing the script and filming video and editing video almost simultaneously on the same device. And it makes it a little bit confusing. So it's, it's very good to have a mental model in your head for this is the way a production should go through its paces. So I wanna talk about the presentation ecosystem that Nancy Duarte laid out. And I wanna spend a little bit of time with it because it's very important for you to create a mental model, a, a flight checklist that you can go through in your head. So after this class is over, you can say, have I done everything I need to do? So instead of pre-production, post-production and, uh, uh, and production, Nancy Duarte envisions the three, three legs of a um, ecosystem being the message track, the visual story track, and the delivery track. Each of these are important. Each of these address crucial parts of what a presentation will deal with. And within each track are several different items. So I wanna take a little bit of time and go through each one. Let's start with the message track. And the first point of the message track, again, is something that we've, you know, haven't, haven't wasted any time uh, laying on your head, the audience. You have to figure out who your audience is. You can't just say, I'm presenting to everybody. You have to know who you're presenting to and you have to know why. Uh, and, and if it's in your own company, if it's five or six you know, employees as your own company, then you have to know who those people are and what agendas they have. You know, the uh, producer might have one agenda, the project manager might have another agenda, the programmer might have another agenda. Uh, you know, they, they all are looking at different aspects and you need to please the, each one of them in their own domains. So knowing what those are allows you to build arguments, uh, you know, to satisfy them. So knowing and studying your audience is very important because otherwise you can't persuade them because you don't know what they're looking for. But uh, you have to figure out who the audience is. Uh, next part of the um, message track is a crucial point. And uh, it's, a, it's a, an important word that you probably never heard of, ideation. Uh, ideation is the sister of creation. You all know what creation is. Creation is the act of creating. And ideation is the act of generating ideas. And while this is an incredibly important word, we don't really use it because there's a metaphor out there that we use instead. And uh, for some reason, you know, no matter uh, how silly it, it actually might be, um, the metaphor wins. Now, metaphor is brain, uh, brainstorming. Everybody has to go through a brainstorming phase in order to generate ideas. And the metaphor of brainstorming is that your, the, your head is sort of a meteorological system and you have to create a storm and you have to make the winds blow and you have to, to um, uh, bring up a lot of uh, violence in order to dislodge the ideas that are hidden and, and uh, in the nooks and crannies. So brainstorming is about thinking long and hard creatively and coming up with ideas that are hidden in the back of your head. Now, the, the unconscious, the, the memory is, is not something we know about completely yet. It's a mystery to us. So where ideas come from, how to dislodge them, 
you know, it's, it's a different thing. And everyone has their own creative process. Everyone brainstorms in a different way. But I will say this um, to all of you who are here to study the creative arts, whatever your process is now, push it. Uh, the one thing we can say about most beginning artists is that uh, they don't spend enough time in this ideation phase. That like the lazy Google searcher, you choose the very first result that comes back from the search engine. Um, if you get an idea, you say, oh, I'm done, and you just continue on your way. But the very first idea is not necessarily the best. It's not always the worst. You can't tell until you have a number of different ideas to compare them with. But in any particular project you're going to do, if you want to do a good job, you need to push yourself beyond the point where it feels comfortable in brainstorming so that you generate more ideas that you really want to have a whole lot of ideas even some bad ones that you can throw out because that's the only way you're going to get to the really good and interesting ideas so brainstorming is an absolute uh must part of every creative act and everyone does it differently some of you use notebooks and some of you, you know, talk into your phone and some of you scribble and some of you just daydream. Uh, how you record your notes or how you, how you brainstorm is up to you. And uh, being new in college, this is a really good time to try out probably some new processes. So we will introduce you to some software that will, you know, help you play around with that and uh, try new things. But Everyone is going to go through a brainstorming process this week as you work upon the main project and figure out what you want to put in it. That's an important beginning step in figuring out what you have to say. So you want to generate a lot of ideas. And once you have a lot of ideas, then we're going to go into a writing editing phase. Some of those ideas can't work. Some of those ideas are good, but don't fit the project, etc. So once you have enough material that you can start to winnow it down, you can start to create a narrative that's based on what your needs are. And you can only do that if you've got enough material. You know, um, we often liken it to that, that guy that's got uh, three, three hairs left on his head and he carefully combs them so it looks like he's got a full head of hair. You're not fooling anybody if you don't have enough ideas. You've got to start off with a lot of material so that you can throw out the bad material and still have enough material to put in your production. Now, we want presentations to be short. So we're not asking you to uh, invest in a lot here, but you have to have enough information that you can make a three or four minute presentation. That's what we're gonna work on uh, for this month. And uh, you know that involves a healthy um, bit of brainstorming so you can come up with enough ideas to talk credibly about yourself and your life and your skills. Uh, so, and then remember, we don't want to just put facts together. We want to tell a story. We need to have a beginning, middle, and end. So after we know the things that we want to say, we have to craft them into a narrative. We have to put them into a form that makes sense. We have to say, this, this is something I'm going to emphasize for detail. This is something I'm going to gloss by and, and, and tell in a hurry because storytelling isn't about giving the same amount of weight to everything in your story. It's about choosing the details that are important and choosing the things that you can go by very quickly. You know, you, you um, some, some of you may have joined the army and it was a pivotal point of your life and you need to talk about it in detail. And some of you may have joined the army and it was just, you know, four years that you couldn't wait to get out. And in telling your story, you, you don't need to go into as much detail about what you did in the army because it's not gonna be relevant. But for the person who uh, learned life skills in the army, we wanna hear those stories. So for each of you, the, uh, the things that you emphasize and the things that you de-emphasize is personal. 
It's about telling your own story your own way. And that's a key process of writing. And the tools for writing, well, they, they vary a lot as well. Some people like to still write on paper, they use notebooks. Some people use their computers or their phones. Uh, we have uh, word software like it, Word. It, it, it's for formal writing, but sometimes people feel like uh, you, can, you can record in there. There are other kinds of writing programs that are more uh, diary-like and that uh, people like to record in there. Uh, and then there's uh, storytelling software. There's script writing software. There's lots of different software for doing different kinds of writing. And you may want to try to discover the uh, process that works best for you. And as a, a, a computer artist, you probably want to start moving to digital processes. You know, if you're, if you're a heavy notebook person and you're writing in your notebook, you can continue doing that. And that's maybe something you'll end up doing your whole life. But to the extent that uh, you, you're going to have electronic tools that are going to uh, allow you to uh, cut and paste and uh, grab a sentence really quick from one, one program and put it in another, et cetera, uh, working digitally is going to be a, um, a very fit, fast and facile way of becoming uh, a, a fluent storyteller. So those are some of the things you might want to start thinking about in the processes that you use uh, for this story and for the ways that you're going to tell stories from here on in. The visual story. Uh, okay, so the message was all about getting to crafting the point that you're going to tell your story. And I'm going to tell you right now, because we're creating an offline pro uh, presentation, your story is going to be told on voice. So the writing is an endpoint, but that endpoint then necessarily goes to recording that writing as a voiceover track. Everyone is going to have a presentation with a voiceover track. So your message story really ends with the voiceover. Uh, but in creating that message, it's a writing assignment. So to go along with that, you then have visuals. Now here's where we start, here's where we can start to use uh, PowerPoint, but you still may not start with PowerPoint at this point, because again, you're gonna go through planning phases. So there are the planning elements of a visual story. And there are lots of different things that people use to uh, collect elements there. There are websites like Pinterest, where you can put together collections of images or you can create mood boards. Uh, you can create mind maps that allow, uh, lay out your ideas. You can write storyboards. You can do sketches. You can do production or uh, concept sketches. So all of these things are preliminary ways of having ideas of, of what, the, what the visuals are that you want to put forth are. And then once you start moving into actually creating the slides, whether you're gonna use PowerPoint or any other program to create slides, you need to think about what are the, what is the level of visual sophistication? Because sometimes you wanna use a slide that mimics what you're saying in the voiceover, but the level of visual sophistication is up to you. You might be talking about a tree and you could easily go into the clip art and find clip art of a tree and you can have a slide that satisfies that moment. But as a slide, it's working to the lowest common denominator. It might be great for third graders. But if you're creating a presentation in which you're trying to impress someone who is above you or has a, a, a larger visual sophistication than you, then you may want to aim a little higher and create visuals that speak to your own artistic depths. So thinking about what kind of imagery you're going to use to illustrate what you're saying is important. And again, one of the things we mentioned last week is uh, if you're a filmmaker talking to filmmaker folks, you might want to use movie stills because that's a common language among you. But if you're a video gamer talking to video gamer folks, 
You might use imagery from video games. You might use gameplay from Twitch. Uh, all of this is the kind of thing that is going to speak to, I know who my audience is and I know who I am and I'm, speak, I'm expressing my visual style. That's part of visual thinking. Another part of visual thinking is using uh, images to, to model ideas, to create charts and graphs or infographics to help people understand complex uh, interactions by a visual metaphor. And if you're the kind of person that can create those things, if you can make visual models that help people to understand complex things that happen in the world, then you're really going to be employed uh, pretty regularly for the rest of your life because it's a difficult skill. And if you have that ability, if you're a visual thinker and you can think about uh, you know, the movement of sales or uh, the, the need for um, a particular kind of product, and you can put that into a visual metaphor that everybody understands, then you're really going to be somebody who can break through and reach an audience. So your, the extent to which your visual thinking helps other people understand what you have to say, it's really important skill to develop. And uh, we want to think about graphic design. Now, not all of us are going to be graphic designers, but all of us have been spoken to by graphic designers. By this point, each of us have received tens of thousands of messages in our lifetime. And so we know what it is to receive messages from coming at us fast. We know what it means to communicate in ways that you understand quickly. And you, one of the things you have to think about with a slideshow is that those slides do not hang out there forever. If your slide is on a long time, then that's a critique I'm going to give you because no slide should be on the screen for more than 20 seconds, none. And even that is too long sometimes. So it doesn't mean you have to have, you know, uh, one, one slide every second. You're gonna change and have a visual pace. But nowhere is the visual pace that a slide hangs on for a minute, a minute and a half, three minutes. That is just laziness. So you're gonna need to create slides that move through time and create pace. And to that extent, people need to understand what your slides say very quickly. You don't want them spending a lot of time. You don't want to get them out of your voiceover narrative because they're having to try to figure out what you have to say. And to that extent, we can look at what graphic designers do in terms of using symbols, in terms of using um, uh, contrast between tech, uh, you know, a clear type and, 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 and uh, contrasty backgrounds and things like that. Uh, to help understand things very quickly. One analogy I like to throw out there is that imagine that you're creating a signage for uh, road signs on a highway and everybody on that highway is driving by at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. They're zooming down that highway because you know we all want to. But whatever that message that you have on your sign is, it's important information that they need to know might be their exit, might be that the road is out. People have to see that in a hurry and understand it and know that information. So you can't use weird Gothic fonts. You can't put crazy colors and patterns behind uh, in the background that compete with the font. You have to have clean, clear illustrations so that people understand and, and get that information in a hurry. And that same kind of communication is important in graph in a, a pr creative presentation. So the simpler, the better. You know, I do not want you to spend uh, or uh, to take six photos and put them in a complex collage in a single image and hold on that image for a minute and a half. If you found six images that you like, put them all on the screen by themselves and let them fly by one at a time. You can even then play around with them building up, but you cannot just throw a complex image at, at the audience and make them decipher it because that means they're gonna stop listening to you because you've given them a visual problem. So remember that you need to keep it simple. You need to guide the audience through 
uh, the narrative and to stay in the moment. So separate your elements, back plates, so that your, 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 your type does not go over uh, complex photographic backgrounds is, a, is a, a really important tool to use. Another aspect that you need to master is motion design. Now by this, I don't mean the gazillion transitions that PowerPoint has built in, but I mean using simple movement to keep people in the moment. For instance, while it's not a great idea to have an entire presentation full of bullet points, there may be a occasion, a, a time or two, that you would have a slide that would need to have some bullet points on. Five, five things that are grouped together that are a common idea that you're talking about. Uh, so bullet points are not out of order, but what happens if you throw an entire slide of bullet points at people is that they will try to read ahead. They'll try to read the whole thing and that takes them out of listening to you. When as a designer, you could start on a blank page and slide in point one as you begin speaking and not slide in point two until you actually comes up in the voiceover narrative. So they don't have to come in at regular points. Uh, they can come in exactly when the voiceover is talking about them. And that just in time information keeps the audience in the moment. And those little bits of motion design control the audience's attention and keep them focused on the narrative. And that's your job as the creative presenter. So all of these parts contribute to the, to the visual message and they're important for you to master. They're important for you to get started on. Uh, don't feel like you're gonna master all of that this month. These are tools that you start to play with. And each time you tell a presentation, you can play with different elements of the tools and try different uh, uh, solutions. So, You'll, you'll build up a vocabulary at a bit at a time. The third leg is delivery. This is how the presentation is received. And this is um, what, what's, what's difficult here is it, it, it runs the range. We originally start talking with Nancy Duarte about live human, human contact. And if we're talking about TED Talks, we're talking about a human on a stage, talking to people in theater seats, you know, the ideal presentation system. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. Presentations are all over the gamut. So the most common type of presentation, like I mentioned, is gonna be just an office meeting. You're in a conference room. There's a, a 10 or 12 foot conference table in the middle of the room. There may be a, um, a laptop on the on the table that is playing the presentation. There may be a, uh, um, a flat screen TV on the wall that's playing the presentation. But you're sort of standing at the table around six or seven other people presenting to them. You know, uh, you don't even necessarily know how to stand because of the way that you're seated. You're all seated at the table. You just need to be addressing them all and looking them face to face. So each circumstance calls for different skills. You know, if you're the single solitary soul on a stage and a thousand eyes are looking at you from all directions, then you need to have the correct posture and you need to know that all these people are looking at you at the same time. If you're in a conference room, you know that at a certain point you're gonna be talking to the business manager and you're gonna be persuading her of this particular point about the budget. And then later on, you're going to be talking to the, to the chief programmer and you're going to have to persuade him about this is going to be a really cool effect. And each one of those face to face conversations is a different kind of persuasion, but it all involves human contact. So the most important part of um, the delivery is human contact. How much of you are there if you're there in person then it's all of you and you're standing there. If you're only four or five feet apart, you know, that's very close communication. Uh, this also includes the elevator pitch, the ever popular elevator pitch. You may at some point in your life, um, uh, get, walk into an elevator and find yourself alone with Jay-Z with 30 seconds to pitch him your dream project. What do you say? Boom, are you, are, are you prepared for that? 
Um, are you the kind of person that would even speak up? Um, but not all of these presentations involve full human contact. Again, an offline presentation is just going to involve your voice. Maybe you don't involve your voice and your talking head. You're on a video. Uh, so we have lots of different possibilities here. Um, we need to know what the circumstances are. So if it's not a live presentation, then what is the media that people are going to encounter this on? Are they going to watch your video on YouTube? Uh, are they being sent to disc? Are they being, is something being streamed to them on a TV? Uh, is it a link on the computer? Uh, is it, a, you know, something that's embedded in a web page? Uh, what is the file and how will people look at it? Are you emailing them an attachment? and they have to click on it and open it up on their desktop. Uh, all of these things are possible. So knowing how the audience is gonna interact to, uh, affects what you create. Because you may be working on a super large computer system and, and having the images look beautiful and you create a YouTube video that someone else looks at on a three inch television or a phone screen is it gonna look good, scaled down that small? So one of the things you have to ask yourself in the production process is, if I'm working at X resolution rate, most of you will probably be working on like 14 or 15 inch laptops. So going on a phone is scaling down, going on a, a, a flat screen TV is scaling up, going on a giant projector is scaling up even further. But do your images look good, scale up or down? Have you chosen the right resolution? Uh, have you chosen the right uh, spatial denominators? Uh, does it look good at all sizes? Because you can't quite know uh, what resolution the audience is going to look at this. Are. What are the possibility of devices? Uh, and and uh, what are devices that may come in the future that you have to guard yourself against? You know. Uh, we're moving into an age where people are starting to use um, v, uh, VR a lot. We're going to have a lot, a lot of uh, Oculus Christmases here. Uh, maybe that's going to become a way that people look at presentations and you're going to have a 360 degree sphere to deal with. Maybe uh, interactive screens are going to become common and people are going to navigate through your presentation. So you have to think about where technology is going. You can't know it. None of us know where technology is going, but as a creative designer, you want to create images that you know that you can repurpose uh, if you know what's coming down the road. Um, certainly, right now, we're all receiving phones that record 4K video. Now, 4K video, um, we're probably some of you are probably getting those TVs as well, but that's enormous video. I mean, the computers we have don't handle it very well. And for the most part, if you're looking at something on YouTube or you're looking at something on a laptop, there's absolutely no need for that video to be 4K. We're still looking at video that looks great in high def at 720p or, or 1080p. And if you don't know what these numbers mean, then you know that's part of a vocabulary that you'll start to learn. But uh, video has different sizes. And uh, it started off as little tiny postage stamps and they get bigger and bigger and better and better and better. Um, but because you have a phone that can shoot 4K, does that mean you need to make your project in 4K? You may have doubled all your rendering times and make it more difficult for you to do your homework. So these are things to think about in your production process, in your delivery process, and uh, to be in charge of because this is your project and you are the producer. The final leg of uh, the delivery process is an odd term. We've traditionally called it paper. We need to maybe need to phase that term out and just call it the leave behind. But basically it means this, the presentation, no matter how great it is, is something that just runs in time and stops. So let's say your presentation is successful. How do you continue the conversation after that? If you were in a live auditorium and you were uh, pitching a cause to an audience uh, and the presentation ended and you'd done a fantastic job and you persuaded them all, 
then where do you go from there? How do you get them to say yes? Do you want them to sign a petition? Do you want them to sign the, sign checks? Do you want them to, to join your cause and sign their life away? What is the next step after that? And so oftentimes with a live presentation, people might create a brochure that has the same design uh, look as the presentation that gets handed out or at least a business card so that people can continue that conversation. In the digital world, we, we tend to call it Chrome. Uh, you know, is there some way on that web page, on that YouTube page, that people can continue to get a hold of you? You know, um, some students think they're smart in that on the very last slide of their presentation, they'll put their phone number or their email address or their uh, Instagram handle or whatever. But I, I guarantee you 100%, there isn't a single person in the audience that grabbed the pencil and wrote that down. The fact that it's in the presentation doesn't mean a thing about people remembering it. So you have to provide the audience with a way to continue that conversation. You have to put the links next to the, uh, the areas where the, the production was received. You know, if, if you emailed the, pre the presentation to someone, then, you know, your email, your, your email link, uh, links within the email are ways to continue that conversation. If you posted it on YouTube, then, you know, you have to have links on YouTube so that people can, can tell you, yes, that's the lead behind. And it's an important part because the presentation will end and it'll either convince people or it won't, but if it convinces them, you want them to take that next step and you need to provide it for them. All right, uh, I took a long time going through that, but that I think is important. At each point along this phase, you have the ability to you know, create a checklist for yourself and say, did I do this? Did I address this? Did I get it right? Can I make it better? And that's what will make you a great presentation artist. And if you think about the process that I just delineated here, none of this can be done if you open PowerPoint first. You have to open PowerPoint, you know, near the end when you start to make the slides. Um, all right. So each of us is going to start creating a plan for the presentation you're going to create next week. I haven't yet told you what that presentation is. I'm going to tell you in a second. But that means that each of you are going to go through uh, an ideation phase, that you're going to collect your thoughts together, and you're going to create a document for me. Uh, this, is, this is not a part of your normal process, but this is the homework. The main assignment this week is that you're going to create a, uh, a, a planning document that tells me the things that you're going to be putting in your presentation. And that means that everybody has to go through a brainstorming process. And there are actually rules for brainstorming. So I wanted to run through those really quickly. So these are the rules for brainstorming. Number one, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. Brainstorming only works if you have a lot of ideas. So don't stop early, just keep going. Uh, you come up with a great idea, say great, keep at it. Rule number two, encourage wild exaggerated ideas. We're not exactly sure why, but just something about the way uh, ideas are lodged in the back of our head. If we come up with strange ideas that somehow coaxes out the other better, more refined ideas. So brainstorming is the time to really think crazy and get outside the box because that is where you're going to shake up uh, all the good stuff that uh, comes loose. Now, rule number three, Quantity counts at this stage, not quantity. So remember, keep going. Uh, I really want to see examples, uh, you, you, your presentations, plans that you give me this, this week. I wanna see multiple elements there. I don't wanna see one or two items. I wanna see four or five. I wanna see six or eight. I wanna see a lot of ideas that you're thinking about more than you can actually put in the show. That makes you a rich man. Now, these next two items are not going to be something that you experience this week because it's about brainstorming in teams and you're all working alone. But you're eventually gonna get hired at a creative company and you'll go through brainstorming sessions uh, at the company as a team. And these are rules for working together with other people. Rule number four, build on ideas put forth by other people. 
So somebody might state something and then you might internalize it and restate it. And that is a way of progressing the idea. It's not a way of owning the idea. It's not a way of changing the idea. It's, it's a part of the process. We're all kind of understanding and then re, uh, reimagining. Uh, and, it, and it comes straight out of that rise model where you guys are, were last week in um, responding to each other's ideas. Um, uh, reflect, inquire, uh, suggest, uh, exp expand. Building on ideas put forth by others, that's what that's all about. And number five, every idea and every person has equal worth. So you may be the lowest man on the totem pole. This guy hired at a creative company. But if you're in a brainstorming session and you have the best idea, it will rise to the top. There's an equality there that uh, it's very exciting. So uh, those are the rules for brainstorming. You're all going to have to go through that process. Uh, but before I get to the main project, I want to talk about this week's discussion. This week's discussion is actually pretty interesting because it's, uh, it's very different. It's not like Oh, write a whole lot of stuff this month. Uh, last week I had you, uh, you know, tell your history and it was important. It was good. This week we're going to talk about ideas and we're going to express ourselves in media. So uh, the storytelling discussion, uh, I need you guys to go through all of the elements that are here. There, we're starting off with a web, uh, with a Ted talk, a fellow named Jillian Treasure is going to tell us how to speak so that people want to listen. And he's really telling you how to speak with your authentic voice, how that you can talk so that people know you're telling something from your heart. You know, why do we avoid used car salesmen? Because we know they're lying to us. And, and people are bad at lying. And, and there's this weird, oily feeling about it. But when people tell you the truth, you can feel it. And that's not to say that there aren't like great actors in the world that can fool us. There are, but... For the most part, it's very hard to lie. It's very hard for me to tell you a lie. If I were to try to tell you two truths and a lie, you would always pick the lie because of the way I tell it. I'm just not good at it. And most of you are like that. So we respond as telling the truth in a very particular way. And, and uh, Julian Treasure has identified it as something he calls HAIL, H-A-I-L. Honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. When you speak with these characteristics in your voice, other people will listen and they will know that you're telling them the truth. Now, why does that matter? Well, we want to try to persuade people about how we feel, about what we think. We want to be able to communicate in a way that people know that we're giving them, you know, our best effort, our, our, our deepest thought. And the way you do that is by using uh, what uh, a variety of techniques that Julian Treasure calls the vocal toolbox. These are very common vocal techniques and uh, they aren't anything that you haven't used or thought of before, but as a, as a strategy for ways to communicate to people, they can be very effective. It's very simple as, as speaking fast or speaking slow. What does it mean to speak really fast? Well, it means you're excited. You, you convey excitement or um, sometimes anxiety by speaking fast. What does it mean to speak low, slow? Well, it means that you're thoughtful or pensive or sad. So you're conveying emotions by speaking faster or slower. You can have dramatic pauses. You can read things with varying uh, degrees of speed and, and uh, uh, um, slowness so that people can feel the actual, you know, um, punctuation in the sentences and the pauses between uh, paragraphs and so on and so forth. So the way that you read it can infect the way other people talk about it. And we've recorded, we've cre created a short video here that goes through these techniques. So you may not have actually intentionally used these before. So this is just the time to begin. It's not a time to become an expert. This is just something to think about. And as you go forward and do more voiceover recordings, each time you can try different techniques, each time you can think about a different way of appealing to an audience. 
but uh, this is a time to just sort of begin thinking about using these kinds of techniques. So what we want, we've got a, uh, uh, we want everyone to make an initial post in which they go out and find an inspirational video. So mostly you're gonna search YouTube. You can find it wherever you like, anywhere that you can bring the link back and put the link in the discussion board is fine by me. But um, you wanna find a video and you wanna put the link in the video. And here's an example. It's a Nike video. These are usually inspirational. Emotion. We're called dramatic. If we wanna play against men, we're nuts. And if we dream of equal opportunity, delusional. When we stand for something, we're unhinged. When we're too good, there's something wrong with us. And if we get angry, we're hysterical or rational or just being crazy. But a woman running a marathon is crazy. Officials tried to pull her off the course. A woman boxing was crazy. A woman dunking, crazy. Coaching an NBA team, crazy. A woman competing in a hijab, changing her story, landing a double cork 1080, or winning 23 grand slams, having a baby, and then coming back for more. Crazy, 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 and crazy. So if they want to call you crazy, fine. Show them what crazy can do. Okay, so that's an inspirational message. It's a Nike commercial. A lot of these are going to be commercials because high-end companies can afford to, to make them and they're really well done. But we want to find we want you to find one that expresses ideas that, that you're very interested in. And then we want you to talk about what this video meant to you. So the main thing is you're going to create an audio entry. One one to uh, uh, one and a half to two minutes long. And you're going to post that along with the link to the video. So your initial post and everybody, I want to you guys to try to get this done by Thursday. If you need more time, I'll let you have it. But basically, um, we want you to find an, a really good example, post the example, and then post yourself talking about the video and what it meant to you. And again, explain the story or message of the video. Does this video inspire or motivate the audience? If so how? Describe in what ways this video applied the hail method. So I want you to kind of analyze that video and talk a little bit about how well it was done. And so you can post that here. Now again, you can post in these uh, initial boxes down here. If you go on to the discussion, you'll see that I've actually posted another example for you guys to look at. Now, uh, when you post a URL in here, it doesn't automatically become linked. So if I want to do something like post a URL, what I need to do is copy it and then go to link, edit link, and add that link in here. And then when I do that, it becomes an activated link. So if you want to put a link in here for other people to look at the video, it'll be fine. If you just put the straight link and other people have to actually, you know, uh, do some work to, to, to make the web page work, that'll be okay as well. I, I'm be watching the discussion board to help people out a little bit. But the other thing that's important is we have the ability to play audio in line. If you make an MPEG-3 audio file, then down here on the very last icon in the toolbar here is a panel in which if you drag and drop an MPEG-3 file onto this box, it will insert and become uh, a message like this. I'm gonna cancel that. So here, um, I, again, I found another inspirational video, and this one is about a fashion house. So it's called House Rules. 
and the last thing the world needs is another beauty brand but that's too bad they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder now i'm not going to play that whole link because it's online here and you guys can all take a look at it yourselves but i want to show you the example recording this is a student responding the last thing the world needs is another beauty brand gaga states the ad opens up on a shot of the superstar covered head to toe in outrageous makeup and costume this one minute ad was created to announce lady gaga's makeup brand house laboratories visually appealing and as wild as ever this ad features all the usual gaga fanfare she just so again i'm going to leave that there you can watch it on your own i don't need to play it for everybody right now because it, it's available in your discussion board. And uh, if you want to take a look at it before you start, uh, I wanted that example to be out there for everybody. But um, uh, that's what I'm asking everyone to do. Find an inspirational video, post the link to the video, and then give me an audio recording of yourself talking about that and talking about the qualities that you found uh, adm admirable in the video and share it with each other. So. Uh, we would like you all to try to get your initial posts in by Thursday and then by Friday or by, by Sunday night, everybody has to come back and respond to two or more classmates. So um, that's where it'll get really fun. Once we get this populated with lots of really interesting, um, you know, uh, visions and messages that uh, you guys will really have a lot of bonding to do because you will have chosen the same causes or pick the same products or, or, or so on and so forth. So um, responding to each other is going to be very, very important. Remember to do that by Sunday night. But uh, anybody that needs help with this. Um, so the first thing you got to figure out is how am I going to record my voice? Well, those of you that have smartphones, you can just record as an audio memo on your smartphone. So when you record a voiceover on your smartphone. They don't want you to talk like you're talking on the phone. Most people when they're on the phone, hold the phone straight up to their face and you kind of whisper because the microphone is right there at your lips. Now, that's a normal phone voice and you don't want to talk too loud because you don't want everybody else to hear you, et cetera, et cetera. But here you're using the microphone as a recording device and I want you to speak loudly and into the room. So you're gonna use your full voice and when you use your full voice, you're going to have more power in the air coming out of your mouth. So you don't want to have that phone right up to your mouth. You want to hold that phone four or five inches at least away from your phone, from your mouth. And that way you'll get a good recording. So if you use the voice memo uh, function on your phone uh, and then you can export it, uh, usually by emailing it or, or uh, uh, DMing it or, or, or do, you know, whatever functions are built into the phone for manipulating that, that memo message, uh, you can move that around and, and upload it. And uh, if, if your phone records in a format that uh, you can't upload, let me know and I can, I can help you convert that. Uh, that's not really a problem either. If you're on your computer, uh, there is some, um, uh, third party audio editing software that we highly recommend for everyone called Audacity. It's, third, uh, it's open source software. It's available for Mac or PC and it's very easy to use. Um, now, if you have an external microphone, uh, that will probably sound better. If you're using the microphone that's built into your laptop, remember where that microphone is. Some of you have never, never, never even looked at it before. But you almost, you're almost having the opposite problem with your phone with the microphone on your laptop. Most of you are seated at a desktop with the laptop sit, sitting on the desktop and you sitting upright. And for most of you, you're going to find that the microphone is built in above the keys on the keyboard right at the hinge where the, the laptop uh, video swings down. So that as you're seated upright, you're about 30 or 40 inches uh, from the phone or from the microphone. And that gives you a weak recording. So what I need you to do, if you're on your microphone, if you're on your laptop and you're using the built-in microphone, 
I need you to lean in a little bit and make your mouth a little bit closer to the microphone and that way well, you'll get a good recording. So these are all just tips for, you know, using your own gear. Once you've uh, played with it a little bit, you'll all know what the best way to, uh, to deal with that is. But uh, I want all of you to try to give me a, uh, a one and a half, two minute recording uh, for uh, posting by the end of the day, Thursday. Uh, do we have any questions on this? All right, so I'm gonna move on to- I do have a question, instructor, sorry. Um, I'm at the gym, so I, I was like listening while um, working out. Um, I might have missed some of this. Are the instructions um, going to be as clear as you explain it? So I know if I have to recap the recording or- The instructions are right here. Read it out. Page 2.3, step one, here's the video I just mentioned. Step uh -huh. two, here's the vocal techniques. Uh, here, here's the instructions for what we want you to do. There's an example. There's the Nike example that I just played. Uh, okay, so it, it's, it's all written down, right? It's, it's all written yeah, in front of you. I, I know that during the during the course, like the online thing that we're doing now, we obviously we use voice chat, so it's um, easily explained. So I don't want to miss out on anything. Sure. Um, okay, but if, if it's all written down exactly just like you said, then it's fine. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah, the thing is, uh, we're very aware that people learn differently. So mm -hmm. uh, written instructions work for some people and just don't work for other people. And that's why I wanna go through all these in class here because a demonstration is a different kind of thing. And you'll- Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why even when I'm in the gym, I just put my headphones on and, and didn't wanna miss the, the class. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, if you ever feel like you don't understand what the assignment is about, just ask. We're gonna have a thousand different ways to look at the assignment. And uh, we, we've really considered that, you know, people need help, not because they're dumb, but because they think about things from a different point of view. You're all here as artists because you think about the world from a different point of view. So I can't treat you all like cows. You're all individuals. And therefore I have to have multiple solutions for you. And, uh, okay. and we actually have- Thank you. Waiting. Um, so the main assignment, heading towards the big project that we're working on, you're, you're planning the presentation that you're gonna make next week. So this week's assignment is simply a planning document. So um, you're going to pitch yourself to a future employer. That is the mean, that is, that is the big presentation that we're doing this month. So you're all having to imagine that you've graduated from full sale. You're going to project yourself 30 or 40 months into the future and everything that you came to school to study, you have acquired those skills. You have created those projects. You've done that portfolio work and you are ready to stand up and go for your dream job. So this assignment is you having a magical four minute interview with your dream employer. What are you gonna to say to them? What are you gonna tell them about you? You wanna tell them the story of you and your brand. What are your skills? How did you become interested in, in what you do? How did you learn what you do? What is the work that you've done? You know, uh, what are your ideas? Uh, how do you feel like you're gonna fit in with the company, et cetera. Now, each of you are going to choose a different company because you need to choose the company that you've always wanted to work for. Who is the dream company you wanna work for? You wanna work for Disney? You wanna work for Blizzard? You wanna work for Apple? You wanna work for Google? You wanna work for uh, Facebook? Um, everyone has a different notion of who their dream employer is. And um, some of you may have a notion of that it's gonna take longer than just graduating from full sale to get there. So if you wanna project yourself further into the future and imagine that you've got one or two jobs under your belt before you went for your dream job, you can do that as well. This is an act of imagination, but you have to think about who do you want to work for? What are they looking for? What am I going to tell them in these magical four minutes that I have all to myself? You're going to speak for three to four minutes long. That's the length of the presentation. 
I don't want it any shorter than three minutes. I don't want it any longer than four minutes. Now, if you don't come in, you know, in that time frame, it, uh, we'll just work towards getting it closer. But that's a target, uh, at, uh, uh, a target length. And believe me, that's a good length. It doesn't go on too long. It doesn't bore people. But it, it, it's enough time to tell us who you really are. Tell us about your experiences growing up. Tell us about your, uh, the things that you've learned. Tell us about the projects you worked on, etc. Now, this is an act of imagination. You have not graduated from Full Sail. You, you have not taken any of these classes yet. So you're going to have to um, visualize this. You're going to have to make it up. You're going to have to uh, story tell about it. And you're going to talk about work that you've created that you haven't done yet. So you're actually going to uh, maybe go on the internet and find examples of 3D um, uh, renderings or, or games that you are the kind of games you would create for yourself. And you're going to say that this is work that I did. So you get to invent these things so that you can have proof of your skill. So the document that I'm looking for is a written document that answers all the questions that I'm looking for. If we look at this um, page here, the very first thing you need to do is identify your target audience. So you need to tell me the name of that company that you want to work for. And then you need to tell me what you know about them because you have to know who they are in order to appeal to them. What are their company values? What are the products that they make that you admire? You know, how are you going to relate to them, et cetera? What is your big idea or what is your, um, what is your brand? In this case, you know, I want to be a 3D animator. I want to be a video game designer. I want to be a uh, uh, record studio producer. You know, whatever it is that your goal in life is, that is the, uh, the, the, the brand, the, the, the idea that you want to put forth. And you want to let them know that you have the skills to do that. So you want to talk about your, your life and you're going to tell us a story. You're going to tell us the beginning, middle and end. And this is where all the brainstorming goes because these are elements that you already know about your life. What are you going to say about yourself that you can add in here that you can help to make sense of what's going on. So the beginning is, you know, how did you begin to begin interested in music or video games or whatever? You're going to talk about your early life. You'll talk about games that you played when you were a kid and, and uh, uh, music that you created when you were younger, et cetera. The middle part is your acquisition of skills. So, you know, maybe you went to the army and you learned a few things there. Maybe you went on the road with a band and you learned, you know, uh, a lot about life there. Uh, maybe you just went straight to full sail. You want to talk about the classes that you took at full sail. So everybody needs to talk about their classes that they took. That means you need to go back to the full sale website and make sure you're looking at all of the classes that are in your curriculum. If you've never done that, let me show you how. Uh, this is the full sale website. Somebody uh, uh, in, the, in the chat box, just type in a degree program and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that through. So type in one degree and we'll, we'll search that out. Game art. All right. So if I go to game, degree programs and I hit games, then I can hit game art bachelors. And if I come down here, I can see that I have a 20 month campus schedule and a 29 month online bachelor schedule. So if I click on the 29 month bachelor schedule, it's going to tell me all the classes that I'm going to take before I graduate. And here we are month one, create a presentation. Hey, we didn't lie. Next month you're taking psychology of play. So these aren't really important yet for you as a game artist, but you come down here and you have, you know, model creation and 3D animation and shading and lighting and whatnot. So what I expect you to do is to pick two or three classes and talk about them as having a meaningful impact upon you. Now you haven't taken the classes yet, but you have to understand what you're going to learn from them and you're going to have to tell us why that's important. If you're really interested in, you know, light and shading, then the light and shading class is something that blew your mind and, and really made you, you know, uh, go to the next level, etc. 
So you need to talk about what you learned in each of these classes. That's what I want to hear in the plan. So that's the middle. And then finally, the end is the takeaway, the call to action. This is where you're going to stand up and you're going to talk directly to that company. You're going to say, Blizzard, I've played your games for years. I've admired you. I admire the culture that you create. I admire the way you program. I admire your, your, you know, your ethical treatment of animals, whatever. I think we can make a great team. You need to stand up and make the ask. This is an important part of your presentation because that visualization is what's going to sort of create a, um, a marker for you to get all the way through the 29 months it's going to take to get to that degree, really. So that's what this class is all about. You're going to create a presentation based on what you can say about what you've learned in full sail after you've graduated. And I don't want anybody to start on the plan uh, presentation yet. This is the plan. These are the ideas that are going into the presentation. So this is necessarily a written document, words on a sheet. And uh, you know, if you want to use uh, different techniques to, to be creative, to, to brainstorm with, you know, I will show you some mind mapping tools. I will show you some uh, uh, different tools for, for uh, creative sketching or whatnot, but most of you should be able to complete this in Microsoft Word. Uh, there's really no need to, to open PowerPoint to do this. Microsoft Word can, can run in outline form and you can do all of this in outline form. Uh, I have lots of examples and again, uh, like I was happy to share the examples last week of uh, TED Talks, I'm happy to share examples this week of what plans look like. So here's uh, a, a Word document in outline format. Person is telling me his target audience, he wants to work for HBO. This is what he knows about HBO. He's talking about his big idea. He wants to be a writer and uh, that's his passion. Here's, here's the beginning elements of what, ha what happened to him as a kid. Here's how he became skilled, you know, uh, the work that he did when he was in college and the classes that he took. The end is how, how he's gonna, what he's gonna say to HBO, et cetera. So all of those are the things that I wanna hear. And, uh, you know, there are different ways to do it. This person wrote in paragraph form. This person wants to work for Netflix, um, but he's put his true message in. That's his skills and his talent. And he, again, we see the beginning, middle and end of his story. So he's written it out in paragraph form rather than uh, bullet points. It really is, is up to him how you do this. This person wants to be a graphic designer for Disney. So she decided to make the, um, the, the, the document that she gives me an example of something she might show Disney as well. So all the elements I'm looking for are here. here. Here are the notions of her beginning, middle and end. This is her big idea. This is uh, what she links about Disney. And so forth, all the elements are here, but it's also a portfolio piece that she can use. And remember when I said, how about portfolio pieces? You wanna include those. But if you haven't created any of your own yet because you're a brand new student, you can choose other work from the internet and claim that it's yours. Now, in the presentation, you'll have to say, this work was received from this place. You, sh you should credit the source. But in terms of uh, visualization, you get to claim that other people's work is something that is an example of what you did. Now here's an example of a mind map. So mind maps are visual. And this is someone who wants to work for Blizzard. And this is what they know about the company. Here's what they think about as their main skill. Here's the beginning, middle and end. So these are the elements of, of their training. This is what they're gonna say to, to Blizzard at the end. Uh, and, and these are all the things that they want to include in the presentation. So sometimes if you're a visual thinker, you know, uh, there really isn't any difference between this as bullet point or as, as uh, outline elements and this, except the way that it's laid out. But mind maps for people who are creative uh, become much more freeing. And if you wanna use those, I will show you, uh, I, will, I will link you in the announcements to uh, some, some mind mapping tools that you can play with. And so you can have fun uh, 
being creative and, and, and doing your brainstorming in that regard. But I want all of the elements that are in this uh, card addressed. Identify your audience, tell me what your idea is or your, uh, your brand, what is your flow of ideas, what will your star moment be? This is not as important, but it's an idea that comes out of last week's reading and you might think about it. And what is the beginning, middle, and end of your story? These are the elements of what you have to say about yourself that you will craft into a, um, a story. And again, uh, here's access to Office 365 if you need to, to download it and you had downloaded it last week. And so anybody that wants an example of some planning documents, I'll be happy to share those. Just send me a message. Anybody that wants uh, you know, help in figuring this out. Uh, one of the questions I get an awful lot is what if I want to work for myself? And uh, that's, that is a fine ambition, but you cannot work for yourself until you've actually understood the industry. So whatever it is that you want to do, find a place that you would like to apprentice and make sure you're going to tell that employer that you eventually plan to strike out on your own. They'll be happy to talk to you. It's not like they won't hire you. They like create, uh, they, they like ambitious people. But don't think that you can come from full sale and suddenly know everything you know to start your own company. You will need some experience. So um, instead of finding the dream job you want to keep all your life, find the job that will be the transition, the mentorship between full sale and your own business. Any questions on that? Um, yes, I read uh, on the discussion board that, you know, some of our classmates already have an education. In terms of the target audience and the storytelling, can we also talk about, you know, the, our past experiences and Absolutely. education instead of the one that full sale is going to give us? The life you lived, I mean, it didn't begin in full sale. I mean, for some of you, you, full sale might be just some small blip on, you know, a major resume. All of your life experience is relevant. And that's why it's important for you to figure out your own story. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I know you will have questions and I'm going to be around all week. So I'll be happy to answer your questions whenever you have them. And uh, I'll post examples as I can. And I will be in the uh, discussion board uh, helping people fix links or, or uh, convert their audio if they need that kind of help as well. So uh, I want you guys to have a fun, creative week this week. And um, you know, those of you that have not yet turned in 1.4, don't forget that. I know it's uh, easy to look ahead, but it, it'd be, uh, it's best to go ahead and get week one put behind you and then you can move forward. Uh, and uh, anybody that needs more time than tonight to finish 1.4, uh, I think I will give it to you, but you should, let, you should get a hold of me and let me know what's going on with you. Also, I, I got a quick tip for, for the class. Um, I know it's like out of context, but um, during that uh, um, target audience um, project that we're going to do, don't get rid of that because, you know, we're targeting um, our future employer or your, you know, the, the future employer that you want to have. Save that document because you could use that for your cover letters because nowadays they require cover letters. And if you research about the companies that you want to apply for, that's going to help you out in the future. That's a great idea. Thanks, Carlos. Anybody else got a question? Comment? All right, you guys have a great week. Thanks a lot.